Welcome to Ear Biscuits, a podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Link. And I'm Red. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we are going to be talking all about our new television show, Inside Eats with Rhett and Link on Food Network. And this isn't. And Discovery ne- Plus. This isn't like a. I mean, we're obviously gonna be talking about the show on all the other things that we do and trying to get you to watch it. This is not a promotion. This is not a promotional thing. This is a, this is, we're two guys. You know us, Rhett and Link. We're friends, we own a company together and we try to make things happen in the media landscape and one of the exciting things that's happening for us personally is this television show. Yeah, if you care enough about us to care about the stuff that we care about, well, it turns out we're pretty excited about this. You know, it's, I mean, we've had a few milestones in our career that were television shows. We yeah. had we had one, Online Nation, in 2000 and what, nine, seven. eight, seven. Wow. I just kind of guess, I, you know, you're my safety net of, of numbers and time, 2007. And then uh, Commercial Kings on IFC, 2010. Nope, 2011. Oh. <laughs> Are you serious? Like. 2011 is like the year we moved to to California because yeah, of that television show. Yeah, so We've been many here memories. almost 11 years. So many memories. But we're going to be talking about like how does this happen? 2021, how, we got another one. How does one find themselves on a television show and then what happens when you begin to produce said television show? Like what are the steps in this process and what did we learn and how did we feel? I will say promotionally speaking that the first episode is out. I mean, depending on when you're listening to this, more may be out. But um, 10.30 on Sunday nights on Food Network. Oh, because if you're listening to this super fresh, like the day this episode drops, it was last night was the premiere, right? Oh, is, is that right? Yeah, because this comes out right. on a Monday typically, yeah. Yeah, yeah so 10.30 Sunday and nights. I was wearing this shirt in the premiere episode. I just thought I'd do that. Oh, there you go. I thought I'd, you know, I thought I'd make it interesting. The Discovery Inception. Plus versions are extended versions, slightly extended versions of the same episode. So it's not, we, it's not bonus footage. It's um, it's some of you, the scenes are extended. You don't there's, have to fit into there's the, some extra stuff in there the if you're half watching hour, Discovery half hour Plus time slot for TV. Um, so yeah, I'm also ready to party. Just as a side note, I see you got your party suit on. We're having. You see that? I got my new party suit. Yeah, like you kind of look like a guy that was just cleaning a floor. Right, I could be working. Uh, he's like, is he gonna, is he cleaning up after us? <laughs> or does he I own mean, the company? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, people can't see the, can't see. The, the, the fact that it matches. It matches, You the bottoms match. It's a, it is a suit, it is a janitorial suit. Good Lord, what happened? Why is this here? Good God. Well, where did you pick that up? Instagram. <laughs> I do all my shopping on Instagram, man. Shout out to Imperfects. That's what this is called. Um, Are you gonna button it up later? Because if you button it up, you look like you're ready to start mopping. I'm gonna I'm button it up when I get to work tonight on the turntables. Yeah, we, we have a party tonight. Christmas you know, party. Th- so we have not been able to come together as a company, as the greater umbrella of Mythical. So everybody at Mythical, everybody at Smosh, we wanted to obviously have a holiday party in 2020. That didn't happen. We obviously wanted well, we to have in the Christmas 2021. Party. In 2021, we planned a Christmas party, and then the week before it, Omicron just like yeah. went buck wild. Yeah. Just butt wild. So we- I thought it, for the longest time, I thought it was butt wild. I think you can say that. I mean, it's a different thing. We were gonna go Halloween, uh, Halloween, Christmas, holiday, butt wild. And everybody- Might be throwing some Halloween. We were gonna do a horror themed uh, sweater competition. So it wasn't just your, your typical- Horror, ug- you just said horror themed. It was horror themed. I, Cause I pay attention to the to the prompts. Um, I knew we were judging I know, it. I know we had a TV show in 20, uh, 2007, 2011, 2011, and now 2022. Yep. And so we do also, I now. For the 2021 holiday party, the prompt was to do a horror themed crazy sweater because we didn't want to do an ugly sweater because that's like five years ago, right? That's pre pandemic. Is he right about this? 
So it's, a Christmas horror though, not Halloween we're, horror. We're, yeah, yeah, it's that, okay. that, that's what makes it cool. Well, we're not doing that tonight. We told him to save it for, for right, next Christmas party. In our meeting the other day when we were talking about this Christmas party, or the, or the, the spring party, uh, Emily was like, can we bring our, she, she apparently worked very hard on her sweater. Because we said she there was, was like, like can I price. bring my sweater? And I was like, I know a lot of you worked very hard on your horror themed sweaters. I'm very excited to see them, but please hold them until the 2022 holiday party. So at the end of the year, we get to, hopefully they won't be too dusty, things are gonna break on their horror sweaters, I'm sure, because people build them, you know, they didn't build them for a year. They built them to like use that night, and now they're like hanging up somewhere, you forget where it is by the time the next Christmas party rolls around. But yeah, we're gonna. And we're gonna change the theme. It'll be not scary. It'll be like happy sweaters. <laughs> no, but we'll, we'll still have to give away Encouraging sweaters. Cash prize. People really stepped up for that, I think. And then yeah. we had to can it. So how do you, I, I do wanna check in and see how you feel about, uh, because I have anxiety about this. And if I have anxiety about this, then you have m even more reason to have anxiety about this. We have not been with all these people. Oh. Um, and there's like 125 plus of them that are gonna be at this party and uh, who work at Mythical. Mm -hmm. uh, we've hired a bunch of people over the course of the past two years. I don't know what percentage of them I have actually met. Yeah. Out of the percentage that I have actually met, I don't know how many I would be able to recognize with seeing the bottom half of their face and then remember their name. Uh, Jenna, are we doing name tags? Uh, yes, we are. We're doing name tags? Yes. I requested that yesterday yes. because of this. Right. How big are the name tags gonna be? Uh, are they gonna be so big that people can't tell that you're looking at them? We oh, need to yeah. do like. Like cleavage we size? Need, no, we need to do like second life type things. Oh, it's where a it's, it's a name tag that hovers above your head very, very large. So people can't really tell if you're looking in their eye or looking at their name tag. I love it. Do we have time to do that in the next uh, eight hours? Uh, I think we have time. Yeah, I think may I think maybe uh, my suggestion would be some sort of like uh, like an old hanger, like old hangers, uh, secured with duct tape to the shoulders, oh. that come up above the top. If everybody would do that for before the party, uh, will be great. Hey, I'm with, you know I'm with you, man, because I have that name fright. Oh yeah, I saw it begin to emerge in the uh, the company-wide meeting the other day. Yeah. When you pointed at one person and said a different name. I, yeah, yeah, I was like, I was recognizing Ammo for his um, uh, his promotion, and I, I pointed at Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, brother. And then I said, if you squint, you guys look alike, and I don't know if that made it better. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you should probably kept that to yourself. I don't know, man. It, <sighs> so yeah, I'm, I was a little nervous about that, but I know we're doing a name tag, so I'm cool with that. And uh, I I am DJ in this party. Oh, I heard that. Did Oh, that's but why you're wearing like, the outfit. I, yeah, that's my DJ outfit. But I don't, and my name is DJ Rhett, by the way. <laughs> well, okay, hold on, no, your name is DJ Straw Beat. No, my name is DJ Rhett. I'm MC Sky and I may rap it, 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 at any point that I want I did to. not name myself that, but I think it was our uh, friend Jaden. Like I was talking about like liking to make playlists and I think he, I, I think it was an accident. Like he's a close friend so it rarely happens, but so when he called, he said DJ Rhett. I think he was thinking my name was Rhett for a second. He had a brain fart. Yeah. Even though he knows us really well. We didn't have so our name we, tags on at the we time. We like busted out laughing. This was like three years ago, pre-pandemic. And um, we just busted out laughing. And he said from then on, he stored my name in his phone as DJ Rhett. <laughs> That's kind of funny, man. To kind of own the fact that he really okay. royally screwed up. All right, DJ Rhett is, uh, but by that, by DJing, you mean I'm still working on my DJ name. But you're, I'm, you're I'm, creating a playlist and then walking around in the party. I you're not staying not, behind a booth. I'm not really DJing, and I don't want anybody to know that you're curating I'm doing the playlist. I'm curating the playlist, and I don't want anybody to know that I have aspirations to be a DJ now, because I don't want that to get out. Will you have on your phone? Because I don't have any DJ equipment in the moment yet. The ability to take requests or to 
Hell skip no. songs. Hell no. But hold on, I'm not saying did w- did you have the willingness? I said, do you have the oh. ability? Do, uh, is your phone going to be controlling the playlist as you um, walk around on your person? Mm, no. Are you lying? Yes, it's a yeah. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's a laptop, dude. Are you lying? Yes. It's a laptop. <laughs> well, at least we're being honest. It's a laptop. You really can't without the proper equipment. You can't really DJ. I mean, like making a playlist is just like a hack way to do it because that's not really that's not that's not DJ. That's the only level of DJing that I am actually comfortable endorsing though, really. What do you mean? For this part. Endorsing? Party. Yeah, I don't wanna seem like, like I'm I, trying I to. Like hard. we did a party one time, in the because we're doing it in the parking lot, and we did it before in the parking lot, and we had a real DJ who was like at the thing, was at the booth, was at the turntables. Yeah. And yeah, I just felt it like was un, it was un, unmemorable. It may have gone, may have been too yeah. high key for us. Uh, well, I'm taking some risks. Oh, really? Um, Playing some controversial uh, artists? No, uh, I'm I'm going for a vibe that I don't know that oh. people are going to be too, expecting. Too low key? You think maybe it's too low? I think key? there's a risk of that. I'm not risking going too hard. Do you have some like just Jim Brickman, just piano music? No, it's not. It's not gonna be. Does everything have a beat? No one's gonna go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Everything has a beat. But yeah. And there, do you have an audible playlist? I, I you Like I can call an audible? Yeah. Like change it? Not like we can start playing a book on tape. I gotta. <laughs> I, well, can, can you just start playing Sapiens? Six o'clock Everyone this morning. Everyone that book. I got up and I was, I was working on it. I worked for an hour on a, a backup. Yeah, in case. Like a vibe change. In case I was wrong, yeah. That thing that was really smart. And um, and then when I was driving in, I came up with another backup. So I'm trying to come up with. Wow, you got a backup to the backup? Yeah, I just don't, you know, this don't is a learning process for me. Don't let people know that. That's why I don't want anyone to know that I'm actually doing the music at all. Like I'm not even going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be part of the party and then I want someone to say, oh, I, who made I like this, this playlist? music. Who's, yeah, it's just who made the playlist, like I've said before. And then you're gonna claim There is it? no DJ you're and I'm say, not the D- DJ. You're gonna say, well, DJ Rhett did. And yeah, the, I am. and then I'll just acknowledge it and be like, "Yeah, you can't take cre- if if people like it, you can't take credit." Well, if you say that DJ, DJ Red, Red is not Red, well, DJ you, Red are you going to explain that to everyone? No, unless it's going really, really well. Is there? It's going not going to gonna be, be. It's not about the music, and that's the that's the vibe I've chosen. It's not about the music. It's about reconnecting with everyone for the first time. And is there a maybe microphone ever. and a PA system? I don't. There's a P, yeah. There's a P, it's not just going to be computer. Well, I know speakers. that. I just want to make sure that. Um, I do know very little though. But this could be the end of something. Are we something, gonna be making a speech is what I'm getting or at. Or the beginning of something. Well, that's your problem. You worry about the speech. Well, no, that's the problem. I want you to worry about the speech because I don't no, want you no, to be no, no. doing the speech in the moment. I'm also gonna that's, be. That's when the party could go real sideways. Yeah, because I'm gonna be uh, partying too. Yeah. I'm not in full work mode. I'm just in work attire. I'm not cleaning up messes either, but I could, I could shave down a surfboard. That's what I like to think. This is like a worker who works on shaving down surfboards. That's what the I've model. Watched, I've watched a few of those. Who videos. was wearing this? I watched a few of those and videos. And I bought it, and I've never seen that. That's the case. That's the, the guy was wearing it, doing that, and I was like, "That's who I want to be." Let's talk about the television show, but first let's talk about something else. Just want to remind you, there's other podcasts. Trevor talks too much is one of them. His guests are surprising and delighting, and they connect with him. You should give it a shot if you've never listened to Trevor Talks Too Much. And while you're at it, Best Friends Back All Right, the Stevie hosted podcast. Check that one out too, if you haven't already. Totally different vibe than Trevor Talks Too Much. Kind of a similar vibe to what we do here. Two friends connecting over their past, getting nostalgic about the 2000s in their case. So the if, friendship is if, blossoming. If you're into that, a blossoming friendship, check that out. And if you wanna watch our old television show, Commercial Kings, <laughs> Commercial Kings, can't say it right. Yeah, I'm gonna promote that too. That's interesting. You can watch it on Amazon. Yep. I believe it's on Amazon Prime for free. Could be wrong, but I think that's right. Just search Commercial Kings with Rhett and Link and catch up on our 
2011 television show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How how does how does one uh, get a television show? This was not our idea, so let's start there. You know, um, we are developing lots of ideas for for all types of what we call traditional entertainment. That means um, movies, television shows of the scripted variety and also of the non-scripted variety. Could be a game show, could be a reality show, it could be a mixture of both. We're developing all types of stuff because we're fans of ideas, especially yeah. our own. But <laughs> we're also open to other people's ideas if they work for us, like Ronstadt is a great scripted podcast idea that did not originate with us, but uh, it was it was really exciting to get on board. Right, so every once summer. in a while, people come along and say, hey, here's an opportunity for you guys to be involved in this project, and that's how this happened. So there was a show that was already in development, and not just in development, like it had been greenlit by Food Network to be a show. As far as I remember, yeah, but I, when you say in development, I kind of feel like it was pitched, they were like, yes, um, the concept at the time, this, the working title was Inside Our Favorite, or Inside Your Favorite. I think it was Inside Our Favorite. Inside Our Favorite, with dot, 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 and our name was thrown out in like the pitch meetings. Would Food Network, Discovery Plus, what do you guys think about Rhett and Link, they could they could be perfect hosts for this thing. Um, inside our favorite, you go behind the scenes into, the, the first way it was talked about to us was- The people. Factories where all these people were working behind the scenes on like factory lines to create your favorite snacks and candies, things like that. So it was kind of like how it's made, but more host on the, on the ground, kind of exploring and experiencing uh, what's going on at these snack factories. And then we were approached. And when we were approached, I think it's, it's important to kind of establish the way that we see opportunities like this, right? An opportunity to host a television show, um, it, I would say, 10 years ago, it was like, that's why we were in this game. We we were doing what we were doing on YouTube to try Let's to- Let's say 12 years ago. Kind of launch into, yeah, because once GMM started, kind of launch into something in the traditional space. But over the years, what we built here at Mythical and the stuff that we're producing has become the priority for us. And so opportunities like this don't, they no longer have this, oh, this is the thing that we've always been waiting for, we've always been wanting, and now we're gonna throw all our time into this and throw everything else away. It's more like, okay, we're not going to stop doing Good Mythical Morning, we're not gonna stop doing this podcast, we're not gonna stop doing all the things that we're doing in Mythical. So the question is, can we make this work? Because it's not just a done deal that it's automatically a good idea, right? We have been approached for other things that we have said no to, but the con Condition for saying yes to something like this was we will do this if we can be executive producers of the show and Mythical can be a production entity on, on, on the show. So in other words, if we can make it our show instead of just being plugged in as hosts. Now we were approached not by Food Network directly but by the production company that hatched the original idea and got Food Network on board and excited about it. That, that production company is called B17. They've produced a number of other shows. You should check them out. You should uh, look them up. So uh, B17 approached us. Yeah. And uh, their executive over there, his name is Rhett. His name is Rhett. I was like, okay, we have a connection. He might but be a maybe DJ. Maybe some confusion. He may be a DJ. No. He uh, never brought that up. I don't know. You don't know that. People don't wear it on their sleeve. Well, if he did, he'd be called DJ Link. Okay, yeah, that, well, that clears it up. I thought about, I don't I mean, I'm not even gonna tell you that I've thought about other DJ names because I just don't wanna put it, I just don't wanna put too much energy out there in the universe about my aspirations. I want it to be something that just kinda never happens or it just happens on my own terms. So I'm gonna stop talking about it. Good. That. But yes, and they had, they had experience um, 
B seventeen had experience with, uh, you know, making shows with tradi- like internet talent, um, and we liked what they had done. We liked them. And the thing is, is that I kind of set it up like we're only going to say yes if we get to be like create the creative force behind the show or whatever. It made us sound like souls. Well, but the thing is, is but that I don't think we were. That's what B seventeen and Food Network wanted. They were. In, yeah. in other words, it's like. You don't want a host who's just like, I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna do my thing, and I'm gonna leave. You actually want somebody who's like, no, no, we wanna be involved, we wanna make the show our own, we wanna be engaged, we wanna be passionate about this thing. Yeah. And also, um, we're really, really, really busy, and we can devote uh, about a day to shooting an episode, just FYI. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and and it wasn't like, oh no, we can't do that. It was like, well, okay, actually that's what we were thinking too because you know, with all the stuff that's being made in the world right now, uh, they're not just throwing out massive amounts of money for the budgets on these shows, right? It's like people are trying to make shows much more efficiently than they used to. So being able to produce something in a day or shoot something in a day is actually the page that everybody was already on. So then we started asking the question like, all right, this loose concept, uh, it, to- it totally makes sense why they would approach us. We've tried all this food, we've eaten all these snacks, we- we've-, we've kind of positioned ourselves as your buddies behind the desk who eat all the th- stuff for you to tell you if you should eat it. Yeah, people who taste things and talk about it. Right, not chefs, <laughs> if, I don't, if, I, if I didn't have to clarify that, uh, I didn't think I had to clarify that, yes. Uh, but not chefs, but food, g- adjacent or well, actually directly related to food but not guys who make it, just guys who eat it, just like you. Food friends. Um, and then the process started, it was like, well. Could have called it that, food friends. Well, we got close to calling it something <laughs> fair. That's it true. was called something else at one point. Well, we can get into that a little bit. There was a couple of things happening sort of behind the scenes and so, there was a desire to differentiate differentiate this from just kind of going into a factory and just dealing with snacks. It was like, can we expand that into just America's favorite food brands? So that might be a restaurant, it might be somebody who makes a, a snack, but just a, a, a food or a place that makes food that everyone kind of knows and relates to and has some sort of point of reference to. Yeah, which is kind of our mentality on Good Mythical Morning, the more we can pull from an experience, um, well-known, Brands, whether that's fast food brands, you know, sit down restaurant brands, or different types of potato chips or cereals, or you know, whatever stuff you can find in the grocery store or on the snack aisle, like it, there's that connection that there's people that are passionate about certain things, and we're very passionate about certain things. So tapping into that passion and then saying, okay, well, let's peel back the curtain and show you behind the scenes there. But there's so much more than just that whole factory thing anyway, that like this show can be more expansive. And then it got more exciting. And then we had the idea to like, how do we sort of ret and link eyes this thing in terms of, we knew that we wanted it to be very comedy forward, right? And we also knew that we wanted it to be very curiosity forward because those are kind of the two pillars of, the, of our brand, curiosity and comedy. And so, that was when we established this idea of what if there was sort of an off the wall, sort of out of left field question that we want to ask about this particular brand. Like when we think about Chipotle, this is what we think. When we think about Cheesecake Factory, this is the question that comes to mind for us. And then can we craft an episode around that question and kind of getting, going behind the scenes to answer that question. Before Chipotle or Cheesecake Factory became actual episodes, do you remember the first example we talked about? I do remember, because I came up with it in a phone call. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we, you know, it's, we were having these working meetings with B17, it was me, you, Stevie, and our development executive at the time, Mallory, we were, you know, we yeah. were kind of like shaping it. It was, it was fun. And so we were coming up with, I remember it was a very preliminary conversation. We were talking about this like, line of questioning, being inquisitive, right. and could one question become like a starting point for an episode or maybe a through line for an episode? 
But when you're brainstorming, when, when you speak in abstract terms, you can only get so excited. And so the, if, if in those moments, on those like nascent calls, we can throw something out there that, it, that you can rally around, it makes all the difference in the world. And so that's when you threw out the example. I don't remember the, how I phrased the question. I thought you said you remembered it. No, I, remember, I know the question. The question was about the foldy chip. Yeah, like um, say we were going to um, a, a potato chip factory to look at like, we're a big fan of Lay's. Let's see, we could go to a Lay's potato chip factory. And I think the question was essentially, how do the foldy chips happen? And how does this brand feel about the foldy chips? And that came from the fact that you have talked about how you like the foldy chips. You prefer the foldy chips. You go after the foldy chips. I've so, even said, I want a bag of nothing but foldy chips. And, so I, and think, I ain't talking about kettle cups. And I think the question, kettle trips. what I had in mind was, is the foldy chip a mistake or is the foldy chip a beautiful mistake or is the foldy chip uh, uh, like, is, is it, is an, ex it an accepted error or is it part of the design? So, right. And and how yeah, how do the, how do the how do the executives, how do the like executive chefs at the potato chip factory or like the quality control people, you know, it's we started salivating over these answers. Right. And um everybody on the call got excited about it. So that became the clarion call of yeah. the curiosity associated with Inside Eats, and even we, though we weren't calling it that. And yet. then of course, as it, as this was developing, now first of all, everybody was like, yes, this is great. Um, now the process of, you gotta be making phone calls to, you know, B17 is reaching out to all these brands because you gotta be like, hey, these two guys here, you can go to their YouTube, you can see who they are. They're going to come to your place and they're gonna sort of like go behind the scenes for this Food Network show. And I mean, not everybody is comfortable with us <laughs> coming into their, you know, finding out about what they're doing. And but in some ways, I would say most brands were excited about it because I mean, let's just face it: you're going to be after you watch an episode, you're going to be hungry for whatever this thing is. But I mean, you have to sell that because the show doesn't exist, and you know there is a level of trust that a brand has to put on the line. And it's so easy for, especially when you get to like like corporatized brands, like someone as big as Chipotle could easily have, you know, somebody's job's on the line and they just, they could just wanna cover their own ass and say, well, there's just as much to lose as there is to gain. If What if these guys embarrass us, you know? I don't yeah. know exactly what this show is, but it is Food Network and I do, I can see other things these guys have done and, you know, we're B17 respect. did we're, a good job. We're good boys. We're, so, we're good boys. We're good boys. We're not we're gonna embarrass you boys. too much. I mean, We've talked some 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 food on our show just because hey, you got to be honest about honest. what you like. But yeah, luckily um, some very high profile brands like Chipotle is huge, you know. Um, to to see to get the vision for it and to say hey, this is this is this could be great for us. And we everybody had, could win. And we had to find four brands. So just to give you, just to give you a little background on this. So right, uh, you know, season one of Inside Eats is four episodes. I mean, by four episodes, that's a short. That's just that's how um, Discovery or uh, Food Network is doing things right now. It's like you know, the first episode, uh, first season. Let's do four episodes. See what people think. At least they didn't order a pilot, and then maybe we work on that, and then no one sees it if they yeah. don't like it. It's like we're gonna we're gonna make an order. It's I feel like it's kind of an extended pilot because four is, is is a short season. But I think it's, you really learn a lot as we'll talk about yeah. that then you can you can really take it, take all that into account when you, when they order more. And I certainly hope they do. Yeah, well, because we learned, we'll get into like how much we've learned in just doing the first four. But so the brands that responded, uh, actually, more than a handful of brands responded and said they were into the idea and the four that ended up working out based on like timing, because this all had to happen, this moved very quickly and it had to happen at the end of 2021. We shot all four episodes over the course of about two weeks and literally, like I said, four actual days of shooting like two days in a row and then like two weeks later, two more days right before Christmas. 
Um, and the companies that we ended up going with were Chipotle, Cheesecake Factory, Cool House Ice Cream, which is a very cool um, ice cream shop that actually is available nationwide. Uh, you probably have seen them at the grocery store, but they're, they're based pints in LA. Next to like Ben and Jerry's. And then Beyond Meat, who we've talked about on the show, uh, you know, basically making plant based meat products. And they had never had anybody enter sort of behind the scenes. But anyway, those are the those are the four that are featured in in season one. And for the first episode, since that's the one that you can watch right now, the thing that we talked about, because we've because this is something that we've sort of talked about tangentially before, is this like when you go to Chipotle, are you a burrito guy? You a bowl girl? You a uh, quesadilla kid, whatever. I'm not saying that that's who gets those things. I'm just. Are you, you a salad robot? Yeah. And we wanted to ask the question: Does what you order at Chipotle say something about your personality? And maybe more specifically, does your personality? Can we know things about your personality and then predict what you're going to get at Chipotle? Yeah, and at least. In the least, we thought, well, that'll be it'll be fun to try. Yes, and it so, was it, so very much in the same way that we approach things on GMM, where we delve into boop, 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 research and science, but we do it from a comedic standpoint. That is, that's really how we approach the the show, especially that first episode because it was kind of a social science question yeah. for Cheesecake Factory. We knew we had to make the episode ultimately about the bigness of their menu. How could their menu be so large? Like wh why, but also how, if you think about it. That, that's a, it's a crazy amount of dishes to come out of one kitchen that then is replicated in all, the, all their different locations. It's, it's pretty wild. And then for um, Cool House, because they had, I mean, arguably pushed the flavors of ice cream just as far, if not farther than any other ice cream maker. I mean, that inspired us to say, well, how far is too far? And would they let us develop our own ice creams? To, do, to answer the question, how far can you push ice cream flavor? Like, what is the limit that you can push it to? When have you crossed a threshold? Because you know we're willing to cross, just dance all over that line. And each other's graves, if they, uh, you know, whoever right. loses the competition. And then in Beyond Meat, the question was essentially, what is, like, what is this process that leads to them being able to make something, make something that is so meat-like? And something we were very specifically interested in is don't you have to still have a familiarity with meat and like understand meat and sort of like meat? Because what Beyond Meat is trying to do they're actually making a product for people who like to eat meat but would like to have a meat alternative either sometimes or eventually all the time. Yeah. But they're if, not if, trying if to not create for uh health reasons or dietary reasons for environmental reasons. Right. So they actually they're banking on the fact that humans generally like the taste and texture and color of meat. But not everybody wants to eat that much actual meat. So how do you do that in a plant-based way? And for me personally, uh, I mean, I enjoyed like legitimately enjoyed the process at every single place. The Beyond Meat episode for me was the one. It, it just gets very. It gets very scientific. It gets yeah. It, was, it gets very specific and like oh, that's this is how it happens. Now there was a lot of surprise and awe. But there was also for that episode because this is all proprietary stuff, like you, they, and they had never let anybody in, they never let cameras in their headquarters right. before. And so there's like a woman who's like looking at the whatever's in the frame and making sure there's not some like secret formula in the back, you know, because there's, there's competition out there with, with plant-based meats. And so we got a lot of information, but we didn't get enough where you could be like, I'm gonna start my own uh, beyond me now. No, we we got all the information, but then at the very end there was that men in black moment. You remember? Oh, on yes, the way out. Yeah, I think that was just like a tussy deodorant that somebody held up in front of us. <laughs> a tussy deodorant. You know tussy. 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 That's deodorant. my favorite brand of anything. <laughs> 
And it kind of is like circular. T-U-S-S-Y. Tussie. Well, the great thing about Tussie is Wait, that can we can... can we do an Inside Eats on Tussie? Well, I hope so. Can we talk about how we used to take a no. Sharpie and change the T to no, a P? No, we do not, you do not eat Tussie. It's a deodorant. <laughs> uh, can you eat Tussie? Okay. On season two of. Inside. I won't even eat. say, I won't even say, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna say it, man. Um. So we're we're deciding that this is going to be our approach. Let's let's move to actually actually filming these things because it was you know it's you get first of all coming out of the pandemic. There's I mean still a lot of safety protocols, a lot of masks being worn up until the second of us actually being on camera. Lots of testing happening. Super safetyness. Well, I want to talk about the team that was kind of working behind the scenes as well to kind of get, make it where when we showed up, everything was going to go as seamless as possible. So, our showrunner T.J. Cham uh, Chambers, um, who is, you know, I would say more so than us, the hardest working person in in this whole endeavor. Right? I mean, that dude <laughs> worked his ass off to help yeah. make this show happen because he's basically worrying about everything from the very beginning to the very end of like delivering the trailer. Oh yeah, Sha edit, you know? shaping and protecting the tone of the show and really shepherding our wishes and the network's wishes and creating something that is not a compromise but is a, the best of both worlds. Yeah, and he's kind of a jack of all trades in a lot of ways because he is a writer you know, he's a writer, he's a producer, he's a director. There's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes and then when we're producing it. And, but, he, and he's more of a, he, yeah, like lots of comedy experience. Well, and because what we knew we wanted, right? Because our experience with Commercial Kings, and if you go back and watch Commercial Kings as, as uh, uh, Link asked you to do earlier, um, which I guess is on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, you'll see streaming. there was a very specific convention that we used back then called OTF on the fly interviews. So the way that we would, the way that we would shoot that show is we would go, we would uh, work with the business, we would make the commercial, and then we would kind of all take along the way take stock of like what just happened and can we just get, stand you guys in front of this building right here and ask you some questions so you can looks like a reality show. Just like they do on The Bachelor or Survivor or whatever. Yeah, or every you, HGTV. You just show. talk about what is happening and in we'll the present use, tense. We'll use that to sort of piece the story together. We knew that we did not want to do that for like seven different reasons. Number one, I don't like that convention. I don't. I. I. I feel like it. It's done a lot. It's kind of overdone, but also it traps you into whatever you said in that moment. It ends up seeming kind of canned. We like voiceover. We like being able to look at what we have done, look at what has been created, look at the footage that we actually have, and then make decisions about how we want to piece it together. And it's also an opportunity to really nail the comedy and change jokes because you're not gonna go back out to that building and stand in front of it again, oh, but God. you can just simply voice over something different. Well, on Commercial Kings, we were really burned because we got into the edit process and we were like, we really need to cut to an interview you guys introducing this next thing or bridging from idea A to idea B. And there was a lot of heavy lifting from a story standpoint that then we just had to go out into like some nondescript North Hollywood location from our edit bays and spend a few hours just standing out there yeah. acting like we were we were back in Nevada, in Nevada or yeah. Reno, or I guess we went to other places besides Nevada. Yeah. Reno is in Nevada, Tonopah, um, and it just it was a lot of work, and it wasn't, and it it's not our best work. No, you know? no, no, no. It's really it's hard to do, especially as two people, because. In the, we you, ended up scripting them, and that's when it got just so that you we could tell. get it done. And then it was like, and with the voiceover, knowing that it's scripted is just everyone. Everyone knows, of course. Yeah, you guys are now reading this thing that you've written. It's narration, and of it's course. and people. It, it's more of an acceptable convention, and more flexible. All those things, but we actually best decision we ever made. We brought for the show. Um, uh, Nick Lopez. If you are, if you're like a hardcore GMM trivia enthusiast. You might know that that Nick was well. First of all, we I'm got not. to know we got to know Nick because Nick was a writer's assistant on Buddy System season two. two. Yep, and we loved him. 
hired him onto the GMM writing team. Yep. He quickly, uh, I think he was a writer's assistant at some point on GMM, quickly uh, moved into a head writer position. And, uh, but he's- Went so, to work on other projects. So talented, he's had the opportunity to kind of just move on to other things and work on other things. But we were like, he'll come back and work on GMM from time to time when we need an extra hand. But we were like, and I think it was Stevie, Stevie's idea was like, oh, we should talk to Nick because he understands show, our voice. The show is not written per se, but if you're gonna go into like, oh, we're going into this situation where there's this guy who is the head chef at Chipotle and we're gonna be asking a bunch of questions, Nick is able to be like, here are some paths that you can go down. Here's some conversational paths you can go down. Here's something that you might wanna ask. Here's a little fun fact that you might wanna bring up. Here's something that I know that he knows because we got it from a pre-interview that you might find a way to reveal in the conversation, like you can get at this in a funny way. So Nick did a lot of work there along with TJ to kind of, what, like when we got to set on that first day, which Chipotle was the first episode that we shot as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say, my I had a, my back, you know this is what happens a lot of times with me when we're moving into a new project. That's right. My lower back goes out and it's just something that I haven't quite got a hold on and I don't know why it always happens, but my back Stress. had, well, yeah, well, I know that's why it happens, but I don't know specifically, I don't know how the mechanically all this stuff happens, but my back had seized up and it was like a nine on a scale of one to 10 in terms of I like how, you, how bad my back can hurt. So whenever you see Rhett that, walking. That whole episode, my back is- <laughs> He's walking fine. I am in extreme pain that whole episode, but, I will hand it to myself. I did a good job of setting a, like car, compartmentalizing the pain in terms of like when we were in a conversation and just being in the moment and trying to be in a comedic headspace. That sucks, man. Um, but you I mean, definitely it's akin can tell to like a almost like a migraine, almost. You know, migraines are worse. Migraines are worse. When, but when when you're it's when almost, the head is when the the pain is localized in your face in your head, which feels like the center of your person. I think that's a lot more disrupting than like, yeah. I am hurt, my lower back is killing me right now, but I'm still up here. I Your can, face can be I happy. can go completely into my head and just exist in my head like that brain on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, Krang. Yeah. yeah. That's basically, I was I was embodying or channeling, Crane is his name? Krang. Krang. Krang, yeah. You did good, right? And I was using the Krang voice the whole time, if that helps explain. I it. was not um, in any pain. I had it. I had some jitters. You know, it's like okay, we're dusting off the, the the well, the dust. Not only of the pandemic, but but like experiencing an entire new crew and in a place where it's like, they're we're just starting this thing. Everybody's watching closely, from a protocol COVID standpoint to like a performance to like what is this show going to be to the network standpoint. But I think one of the main things that I, f I feel great about with this show, and I felt it very early on, the first time we shot something was that first scene. First thing we shot was around back, this guy pulls up and he's unloading um, all of the the raw materials, the vegetables and the chicken so and when stuff you see this, just for so, Chipotle. Just so you know, when you watch this on the show, this is probably halfway, or maybe even a little longer than halfway through the episode when we approached this guy unloading the stuff in the truck behind the Chipotle. First thing we shot. That was literally like we had, we, would ha we were doing our like hair and makeup and in inside the Chipotle that we were shooting at. Right. And then we were, they were like, okay, this is your first scene. Cause again, everything has to be shot according to when things are happening. And then later it's pieced together to make a, a consistent narrative. But so yeah, us walking around that corner and making that law and order joke <laughs> was the very first thing we shot with uh, Inside Ease. Yeah, and we're like, we got a couple of questions for you, and he's like, how are you doing? I was like, oh, you're, you're gonna start with the questions. And I was like, all right, we're in the mix. Things are, this is happening. And we were off to the races. It felt it felt great to, to say at the end of that first day, or even halfway through the first day, that my, my main concern had been alleviated, which was, are we gonna be in our zone? Are we going to be this? Ourselves. Ourselves. Are we gonna be comfortable, confident, and having a good time? 
Are we gonna take everything that we've learned from Good Mythical Morning? And even when things would change over the years with Good Mythical Morning, the bigger the change, the more chance that, some, that, that all of a sudden our vibe would be off. And when everything is new, your brain, my brain, tends to focus, it doesn't yet know what to tune out and what to focus on. Oh, there's new people in the crew, there's new cameras, there's, it's cold today, I don't, I'm wearing something different, I'm this, that, and the other, your back hurts, all of these type of variables, you have to, be, you have to know what to tune out and what to focus on to just to be the most, to, to be true to ourselves and just trust our instincts and be in that moment. Well, and I was very, very happy that this show is, you know, we were never put in a position and we never stepped into a position that was, that stretched us in a way that that wasn't a good idea. For me, that just because the people that we were working with had very clearly communicated that they understood what makes us who we are and they wanted us to be who we are. Yeah. So I don't think I ever felt any, there was never a question in my mind of like, are we gonna be put into the right circumstance to pull this off? It was more like, you know, there's a, we are always doing this little dance, you know, we, we had watched the most analogous thing to this in the recent past is the backup plan series that we did on GMM. Right. That was sponsored by Geico. Yeah, when we went to the cereal factory. Right. And so got in the We we actually the huge cereal bowl is a great example. We sent those uh we sent that episode of the cereal bowl and uh there was another one where we went to oh the, the flavor the, the smell the uh the flavor factory. We sent those over to B17 and TJ and everybody and we're like you know, we've done this type of thing before and this is sort of the vibe, right? We're asking a real question, but we're doing it in a ridiculous way. There's gonna be these ridiculous asides and we're obviously entering this situation as a comedy duo. Uh, I hadn't watched those in years and I remember watching them. And I, I remember that night I watched them and immediately sent those two episodes to you and Stevie because I was like, hey, I didn't know how I was gonna feel. You never know how you're gonna feel about something when you go back to it years later because you yeah. always feel like you've developed beyond it or whatever. Yeah. I was like, hey, this is the this is the true north. The way that we interacted here, this is how we this is the vibe that we should attain, right? This is the vibe we should go for. Yeah. And I yeah, I think we we really got there. I mean, it, there's always a little bit it depends on what we're doing at the time. There are moments in this type of format where we get to a place where me and you are standing there talking to one person and asking them asking them questions and not doing something and it gets to be like two guys interviewing one person and since nothing is scripted again like yes we have this notebook that's like here's some some questions you could ask here's what this person knows here is the goal of this scene we had all kind of developed that and then Nick and TJ had put it in this big binder that we were given when we got on set so we could reorient ourselves. But when the camera starts rolling, you don't remember what the binder said. You you remember bits and pieces of it, but you're really going on instinct. And so yeah. you've got what you're thinking, I've got what I'm thinking. Oh, Link just said that, I'm gonna go with that or that makes me think this. I'm gonna get out of his way for a second. There's this, De there, there's a balance in trying to figure out that dance again. Yeah, the brain gets hot, there's but it, a lot going it, on. It pretty much came back immediately. It wasn't like a yeah, struggle. Very glad about that. So I think, you know, so when we were bringing our comedic sensibility and our curiosity to the table and to every scene, having structured the episodes and gotten approval on that, the thing that, Food Network was bringing what to us was an education on their expectations from their audience because this is this is a melding of two audiences, you know, between a Food Network Discovery Plus and Mythical Beasts. And I would say and I would like to talk about that. I would say specifically Food Network, which yes, Food Network is a part of Discovery, but when we got approached, we actually didn't know. I don't know if I missed it or if it developed later, but we didn't know that it was a Food Network show. It, we, the, the conversation was Discovery Plus. So right. it, it, I knew it was gonna be food centric because that's the whole point of the show. 
But the moment that it either became or I finally realized. We didn't know if it would be comedy centric with food, but well, it, there's beca- a th- it, yeah. it became clear that it needed to be food centric. Right, and when we say food centric, what we mean is that, so a person who has decided to turn on Food Network, and maybe you're one of those people, um, if you're like me, you're just the kind of person that just likes to look at food, right? You like to look at food and see people make food and see people eat food because you have a love affair with food. I, it's probably the best thing on earth besides what rhymes with Tussie okay. that we talked about earlier. Um, and so people who watch Food Network, they need to see food. Right, they don't just want to see two guys being stupid, being funny. Yeah, because if you're if you're a Food Network first, if you're tuning in for Food Network first and not Rhett and Link first, you're like, I'm here for the food part of the network. I don't want these two guys to get in the way of the food. And so there was a there was a there was one guy who had a, a sort of a specialized camera. It was a different camera that could uh, do a really high frame rate for slow motion. Hmm. And he was the food camera guy. Yeah. And so if the guacamole is being made or dipped out of something or steak is being chopped, it's like that's when those sort of hero shots or whatever you want to call them, slow-mo sort of dramatic food shots. He was getting all, and, and as he was getting all this footage, me not really understanding the show that we were making yet, I was like, Wow, he's filming a lot. He's filming all this food, but like, I mean, it's gonna be us on camera, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, it's gonna be the funny guys on camera, right? So there was a re- there was there was a realignment that happened in terms of like understanding the where everything should settle, what the balance should be for this show, and really beginning to understand and getting that Food Network education that hey, the the audience wants to indulge with their eyes, you know? And then you can, yeah, we can have fun all along the way, but you wanna indulge and you wanna learn. So as we were in the you know, post phase of editing everything together and we were giving a bunch of notes about like, all right, I remember saying this and we had, it was funny. Or I remember Rhett said this, they're like, there's three things from Rhett, there's nothing from me let's have a little bit more balance or vice versa. Like we would give these type of notes right. or this is a runner, I think we can have a throwback. You know, comedy notes. Uh, yeah, the thing that we're interested in. And then, we, then the Food Network notes would be like, we need, we need to understand more of the process. That you started making the guacamole, but we don't know what the final, you didn't reveal what the final ingredient was. It didn't come together. It's like, you gotta, you gotta have, if you're gonna go into this guacamole moment, well, it needs to have a beginning, middle, and end. You gotta have a satisfying conclusion so that people feel like they've got the full guac experience. And, you and it totally s- makes sense. And you wanna see the guac, and hey, if there's a fact about how many avocados Chipotle uh, goes through in a year or a week or whatever that fact was, that's an interesting thing. Sort we didn't ask that in scene, but we can pull a voiceover. We can change that. And whenever you start to learn these things, like, well, now let's add another layer where we're doing some some animations that illustrate the things that you're learning from a culinary standpoint. And I think the point- and so that was added to I, the show. I think the point of this, like what I'm hoping that you listening will take from this, this discussion um, is, you know, if we made, this this show, and we were making it for good the good mythical morning audience. We were do- right. going into the into Chipotle and asking this question, and then putting it onto an episode of GMM or as an episode of GMM, like we did with the backup plan. Because you're t- tuning in to Good Mythical Morning, we think primarily to hang out with us. Then it's going to be a bu- It's going to be almost like ninety to ninety five percent just us being us and using this canvas of Chipotle as an opportunity to be funny, right? Yeah. But because the intended audience is first and foremost someone who's interested in food television, food network, it is a food show first that we are then bringing all that Rhett and Link ridiculousness and curiosity into. 
uh, to kind of create more of a balance. So while I do think it is the most, uh, I don't wanna say it's the funniest show on Food Network. I mean, I think Guy Fieri is very funny. Uh, but I think it is the most like intentionally comedic show on Food Network. You know, um, and, and shout out to Alton Brown, who we still want to have on GMM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he had he did more of the like this sketch thing at the top of his show or one of his shows, and you know that that's another thing that we we did succeed at starting with comedy. Like, there's basically. Well, let me, let me Luke, clarify real quick. I just made it sound like I, I was saying that Guy Fieri is unintentionally funny. No, I'm I, I'm just saying that like, he's coming in there first and foremost as a chef who happens to be very funny. We're coming in as comedians who just happen to have some knowledge about experience with oh, food. Oh, I got you. You know what I'm saying? I got you. Um, but yeah, I am curious at this, you know, we, we're, we're talking to you and kind of telling you what our perspective is. And all of this, I think, has come together in a show that makes the most sense, that is satisfying on all of these levels. You know, are there as many jokes as we made? Of course not, there's but, lots of stuff that got cut. But there are more, just so you know, again, when you're doing linear television that's actually gonna show up on Food Network and have commercial breaks, that, that episode is about 22 minutes of content, right? That's how much content ends up being in a half hour block of traditional television. So you gotta hit 22 minutes. Obviously on Discovery Plus a streaming service, you don't have to hit that. So um, we had these additional, sometimes a completely new scene and sometimes just a new thing that happened in a scene. And all those have been added in when you watch it on Discovery Plus. And so you might get like a 25, 26 minute episode on Discovery Plus. And most of that's gonna be stuff that wasn't essential or integral to a food network audience. But, and so it tends to be some of the funny sort of tangential stuff that happened in the moment. The thing that I'm most interested in at this point, because it hasn't premiered yet as of this recording, is, yeah, what is the reception gonna be? What what are Mythical Beasts going to think of it? What is the Food Network audience gonna think? How are we gonna find out what non-Mythical Beasts Think like where oh, are we going to get that feedback? I'm, I'm sure we'll I'm sure we'll find that out. You know, it's like we'll have to go to other places and other ways that it, the show is posted online or um, or promos of it are posted online just to you know to, to tap into that buzz. But I'm just I'm interested because again, it's like every time you put something out for a new type of audience, it's like, well, are they get, are they going to hate one or both of us? Well, there's and I just know, you know, I I just I know that with the way that I do things, it's like I, I some I'm not for everybody. <laughs> I'm not for everybody, so I'm kind of prepared for that. It's like, and I, but I don't, and if that's the reason that show doesn't work, so be it. Well, I guess the show I'll, ain't gonna work without me. I just have to do season two alone. No, this or maybe is your I'll do it with DJ Red. No, it's this is your opportunity to say people don't like me either. That's true. People, a lot of people don't like me. Maybe more people than don't like you, right? But so there's a there's a question of like, is the traditional sort of Food Network audience going to be like, I w I want to see somebody who's making great food. I don't want to see a couple of idiots who are just having fun with food. Um, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, are there people who are like, I'm just coming here for the ridiculousness of Rhett and Link, and I don't care about all the food shots because we have made a show that is a compromise between what both parties want. I believe that, I mean, for me, because I do like food a lot and I like food facts and I like to see the process. It was fascinating to get to know the people who are making the decisions about what ends up on the Chipotle menu or the Cheesecake Factory menu, the people behind these incredible flavors at Cool House, the scientists, the flavor scientists behind Beyond Meat. Yeah. That's all super fascinating stuff to me that's personally more fascinating than me making a joke. Um. So I feel like it landed in a great place. I do too. I'm very proud of this show. I was very proud of Commercial Kings. And if we had the opportunity, if they had ordered more, it, we would have turned a corner and it would have gotten that much better. But the, but the core of that show was, was something I'm very, very proud of and I wish they would have ordered more. I'm, I'm glad that they didn't because Good Mythical Morning may have never existed. 
uh, and we wouldn't be here today. But we learned so much in these four episodes yeah. of figuring out what the show is and how to ask those questions and what we should actually be shooting and the things that we should actually be doing that I feel like, uh, I'm not saying there's We anything, have so much more focus. There, I'm not saying there's anything, I think where we ended up with season one after a lot of edits and a lot of back and forth and figuring that out, we kind of know exactly what the mode is and what the final product is gonna be going if we can go into a second season where I would just be that much more confident to make a great television show. But we've we've experienced enough to know that like, you know, it could go either way. We're very hopeful, we believe that this show has legs and we wanna keep making it. But, you know, there's so many factors, not yeah. the least of which is who, again, at this point, who knows how it will be interpreted, how we will be interpreted within like the Food Network programming. It's yeah. just very, because it, it, is, it is a different type of show that pushes the comedy more and it, it is, it's unique. So that's a, that's a good thing if, if enough people are ready for it, if they have, mm, pun intended, an appetite for it. Now, I haven't really come, I haven't made a definitive decision about this, but I am considering and strongly leaning toward not reading anything about the show. Not looking at anyone's thoughts about the show. We've never done that with anything we've made. Well, but why would you start now? I'm getting much more, actually, I'm moving in that direction much, much more. I, I find it to be a much healthier place because um, while the vast majority of feedback that we get on the things that we do is positive because we've got such a supportive fan base, you first of all, you know that the minority comments who are gonna say something hurtful, those are the ones that you remember, but also I find myself not being in a healthy place when I'm trying to find the positive comments to yeah. outweigh the negative comments. And then I realize that I am finding my identity and my value and other people's interpretation of my work where what I'm trying to do is get to a place where I am happy with what this ended up being. And so that's the only thing that I need to know is that I am proud of it. I know what I like about it, what I don't like about it, my thoughts about it, what I would do differently. Now we have people who are here at Mythical who are going to tell us the aggregate opinions of people, which are very helpful. I'm not saying I don't want to take the audience's reception into account because you're not a good producer if you don't do that, if you don't know what the audience thinks. But there is something that happens emotionally and mentally when you interact directly with either a compliment or a criticism that I don't think is necessarily good for my psyche. Well, I, I applaud that. I actually think, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because I said that we've never done that before, but the more I think about it, I, I, I read stuff less and less. Like I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, what's, the, what's the per, I'm a hermit. In a lot of, I'm like a social media hermit. Like, I mean, you, you tell me lots of things that I don't read, that I, I, they never cross my path. Yeah. So, so I actually, you're a lot more prone to it than I am. I, I think I'll probably end up just being like, well, I didn't end up reading anything. Well, it's things like. I, but a new project is I can be having a different than like the ongoing stuff. I can be having a good day and then I make the horrible decision to like go and look at, and I haven't done this recently, I'm just saying, I'm back when it was a relevant thing to do, um, look at the Goodreads reviews for The Lost Causes of Bleak Creek. Now, first of all, again, the aggregate of that book, the rating is very high, right? I'm proud of that book, obviously, we're not novelists, and I, I didn't think it was gonna be like win the Pulitzer Prize, and we learned a lot in doing it but I'm proud of what it ended up being for what it is. But there are people who come to Goodreads who see themselves as literary critics and then just write these scathing reviews and some of them you're like, well yeah, that's true or mm, yeah, you're right about that. 
That puts me in, but I already know what I think about that process. I already know how I feel about that book. I already know how I feel about what we would do differently if we were to do a a, a second one in the series or whatever. Yeah, so you're not learning anything. I'm only suffering emotionally. So as I try to release myself from things that I can't control, which is people's opinions about our work, what I can't control is our work, right? I can. I have an opinion about it, and that opinion can be incorporated into the next iteration, and it just feels like a much healthier place. So, because of all the things that you were just saying about, yes, there's going to be people who are like actively like, I don't want this on my on my network. I don't want these YouTube idiots on my network for whatever reason for hangups that they have, or they just like you said, they don't like us. They don't like our sense of humor. It's stupid. Whatever. They don't like the fact that you're picky. They don't like the fact that we're not chefs. Feeling that they don't like my hair, whatever. <laughs> Do I already know that there's people who think that. I already know that there are people who think we're insufferable. Do I need to hear them say it? So we also don't need them to change their mind. Right. We're 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 doing just fine. Yeah. And so I I guess what I'm saying ultimately is I don't think I'm I'm definitely not going to seek out any sort of you know, I heard somebody say one time, like, never read your book review, never read your movie review. Like, if we ever have the privilege of making a feature length movie, I don't think I'm going to read any critic reviews. Oh. I don't think I'm going to go to Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I'm going to know what the aggregate score is because somebody, you can't avoid it and somebody's going to tell us. It's going to be in some report that comes in an email. Everyone, uh, your movie is, a, it is currently at a 61, uh, so it's certified fresh, but just barely. And, uh, most of the comments are about the choice you guys made to include uh, the scene where the dog dies and you really shouldn't have done that, whatever, you know? And so it was like, yeah, well, we shouldn't have put that in there. Yeah, I don't wanna overstate it either. I don't wanna be like, I'm just saying that like, what I've noticed a number of times is I'll be like, I'm things are good right now and then I all, all of a sudden I'm reading something. And I just then, know what the weaknesses are. I'm not I, saying it those ruins that, my day. I'm those saying things that, that you mentioned are things that we already know. People are gonna be opinionated about the way that we look, the way that I act, my the, our non-chef. Like there's, there yeah, there's some targets on our back if you wanna be critical. But those are things that I don't wanna change about myself. The things that really hurt are the things where we know it's a weakness and we wish we could have changed it. Like that's when it really gets me, is that like. Yeah, but I think there's, but I guess what I'm saying ultimately. There are some of those things, that, but those are small. When it comes to these four episodes, there's not any gaping shortcoming. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That I, I feel is like a big weakness. It is what it is. I agree I mean, with it's that. Not, it's not, you know, again, it's not, I mean, we're not, it's, I was, honestly, it's like, is it, are we trying to win an Emmy? Not, no. No, of course not. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe eventually, but we don't think that this show is no, gonna No, it's like, I mean, some, some of my favorite shows ever, I don't know if they ever won an Emmy. Did right. Dirty Jobs ever win an Emmy? Yeah, so, I maybe I don't so know. So what? What I, I think it deserves one. I completely agree with you that the stuff that I already know to be true, um, or so it's like this person thinks this thing and they perceive us in this way. Like that's not the stuff that bothers me. The stuff that bothers me is the stuff that I already know to be the to be the case. Mm -hmm. That's like like yes, we made this mistake or we did this thing wrong. And now people are basically recognizing that and my worst fear of people finding out that we made this mistake and did this in the wrong way is coming true. Right. What I'm saying is from an emotional standpoint, I already know the mistakes that I've made. And I'm not talking about with this, I, like I agree with you, I don't feel that way about this, this show. I'm just saying in general with the things that we put into the world, I have just found that I'm in a healthier place when I'm like, you know what was lacking about that thing that you did. Do you need somebody to tell you when you already know? And do you gain anything emotionally from it? So if I can have somebody else read all that all that feedback and then come to us and be like, hey, this is actually how things were received from a whole group, that's much less emotionally sort of unsettling than reading individual people say very personal things. And so I'm not saying I can't deal with it, I'm just saying, after it happens, I'm, I think to myself, I could have not, I could have not experienced that, and I and I would be having a better time right now. I would be in a healthier place. Yeah, um, I, I get it. This is not 
a GMM22 scenario. Oh. And you know that. Of course. And I, that's, I think that's my point. Yeah. You know, it's like, we did that first We Feast snacked video. And I read those comments. And you get the people who don't, they're not fans of ours and maybe don't have a point of reference for us. And yeah, I do remember the comment about me that was like, this guy just, he like, he acts and eats like a four year old. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> that's, you, you, he's, this commenter is describing something. It, that could have hurt my feelings, but the thing I'm, the thing, the way I'm trying to grow is, is to interact with the, not interact with the comment, but to, to acknowledge the comment within myself as, you know what? He's describing something that people are attracted to about my sense of humor and my persona. Yeah. That he doesn't get or doesn't prefer. And it's not for everybody. And you know what? So, I mean, but I but I was fully myself, and I'm very proud of it, and I don't expect everybody to like me, and, I remember, and I'm, I'm and cool I with that. And I actually remember thinking- Just trying to be cool with that. It, that's a good example, because I remember thinking that when we left that first We Feast shoot. That I, I, remember was, th I was like a four year old? <laughs> yeah. I remember thinking, we were really ourselves, and we were having a genuinely good time just being ourselves and interacting with these snacks. And I am proud of what we did. The only thing I was pissed about was they didn't buy the right cereal. So that's why there was no cereal in the episode. And they also cut they edited your out. beans. I did have you, baked beans and that was it. So just out. for the record, Rhett ate beans and I ordered cereal, but Raisin Bran is not Raisin Bran Crunch. And that's not, and by the way, Raisin Bran is not Raisin Nut Bran. Okay. And that's the one I actually ordered because I'm on that kick now. Raisin Nut Brand Crunch or just nope. Raisin Nut Raisin Brand? Nut Brand, not right. Raisin Brand Crunch. But, so, not, I And mean, I was pissed about that, but you know, mistakes are made and. And I knew when we came as a duo. It really we, isn't we, a big deal. <laughs> when we came as a duo and we had all those snacks, I knew that, that something was gonna be cut out. Um, but what I'm getting at is, even though I did, when it came out, I did start scrolling through the comments. I stopped because I was like, hold on, you remember walking out of there and thinking to yourself, you did that the way that you wanted to do it. Now, anytime you venture outside of your protective bubble of your, your mythical beast, your mythical beasts, um, you know that you're 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 ready for you're gonna get some criticism. And so again, I was like, yes, people aren't gonna like it. Some people don't, don't some people just look at us and are immediately annoyed. I understand. I I get it. <laughs> I, I know people like that too. Um Right. But if I'm happy with what I did and how I came across, then I should just let that be what I found the satisfaction in. Not that somebody liked it or di didn't like it. Again, because I don't wanna just hear things that people like either. I'm saying that finding any sort of value or currency in people liking me or feeling undervalued because people don't like me, I'm just trying to move to a new level of existence. And it's really difficult for a performer who oh, yeah. has built a career on trying to please an audience. It's just part of the ongoing struggle. So when we've got something like this, that's, again, I don't know how many people are going to watch the show compared to how many people watch Good Mythical Morning. I think less, <laughs> given how many people watch Good Mythical Morning but it's still going to be perceived as some leveling up. It's like the people back home in North Carolina, oh, they're all excited about the TV show because it means more to them because they think that being on television and instead of having a YouTube show is like a fundamentally different, more awesome thing. And it's just how people think about things. And so you feel like you're stepping up onto some sort of uh, pseudo pedestal and now people are gonna be like, well, now that they've done this, now I've gotta have my opinion. And I'm just like, well, I already know what I think about what we did. I already know about the show, so I should not even hear your opinion. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I got a little wreck for you. If you wanna do some easy listening, I played this for you the other night. Jose Gonzalez. Yeah, I like him. He is uh, uh, Swedish. Well, he's from Sweden. But he's. That's what I thought from the name. His parents are Argentinian. I was like, that sounds like a Swedish name. He's, he's of Argentinian descent, but uh. he was born and raised in Sweden, and he's got this, um, this just totally soothing, just go into nature 
and listen to some Jose Gonzalez. His last, his, his most recent album. Where's my phone? I've got so many pockets in this suit. It's in your pocket, DJ it's Red. My, it's my top pocket. Listen to his album, Local Valley just to get some good bucolic vibes going on. Man, an introspective and autumnal folk and indie pop blend that's pastoral in experience. Jose Gonzalez, he's got a lot of albums. You're welcome. Hashtag Ear Biscuits. We Let's keep the conversation going. Next week. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.